Greetings one and all, Laszlo Montgomery here. Thanks for tuning in to the China History Podcast. Well, we finished off that five-part series on the Taiping Rebellion, and from there we move on to an event that happened a mere seven years after the Taipings were vanquished in the city of Nanjing. And approximately 6,500 miles to the east of Nanjing is the city of Los Angeles, a place where I currently reside. Today, I wanted to tell you about a horrible hate crime, as all hate crimes tend to be, that happened in this very place exactly 150 years ago on October 24th. This was in 1871, post-Civil War. Ulysses Grant was two years into his first term. More than half of my listeners live in nations other than the U.S. of A., and I'm guessing today's topic was never taught in your high school. And I'm betting even here where I live... This story is mostly unknown. So, with the century and a half mark approaching, I thought we'd look at the L.A. Chinatown Massacre. Because San Francisco is so much closer to the gold mines of Northern California, that place attracted the greatest number of mid-19th century Chinese immigrants, and consequently, that's where most of early Chinese American history took place, in Northern California. The first Chinese immigrants to call L.A. home came in 1850, or at least that's when their names started showing up in city records. By 1860, there were a grand total of 14 Chinese who called Los Angeles home. After the Golden Spike was pounded into the ground at Promontory Summit in northern Utah, many Chinese and other immigrants wandered down to L.A. to see what opportunities existed there. By the time of the 1870 census, there were about 234 Chinese living in the city. Not a lot, with a total population of only 15,309. The Chinese barely made up 1%. The City of Angels was a mostly Anglo and Hispanic town by a landslide. The Chinese mostly settled in a part of town that today can be found on Los Angeles Street, across from Union Station near to the location of the Chinese American Museum. Back then, that stretch of unpaved road was known as Calle de los Negros. As I mentioned, our story takes place in 1871. Voices such as John Bigler had been railing against the Chinese in general, and the matter of immigration in particular, since 1852. So already, the sentiment among many was not sympathetic towards them. Calle de los Negros had once been a nice neighborhood, but after the title to the properties there changed hands over the years, it later became a vile and dangerous place where vile and dangerous people congregated and engaged in all manners of sins of the day, murder included. Back then, men walking the streets were always packing. Liquor and firearms never mix well, and so people getting shot on the street was not uncommon. This 500-foot-long strip of road was a dangerous place where one could wind up dead just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Nonetheless, as immigrants across the country from coast to coast were wont to do, moving into these dangerous neighborhoods, well, many Chinese ended up calling this road home. And in 1870, the Chinese who resided there mostly occupied an adobe brick building known as the Coronel Block. The way the Chinese people were organized down in L.A. was kind of like a scaled-down version of what you found in San Francisco or New York. There existed these huiguans. A huiguan is a term that means an association or a society or even a club. The Chinese knew nobody liked them. They were living in what was decidedly a white man's world, and after learning fast how easy it was to be victimized, the Chinese did what came naturally and banded together in groups according to the place they came from or perhaps by their surname. And these self-help organizations, these huiguans, emerged that tended to their needs and sorted things out for them when trouble knocked on their door. The Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association was the most famous of them all, the CCBA. That was a good example. And these Huiguans were led by community leaders who got in at the ground floor, arriving 
earlier than most everyone else and who had already achieved success. And for these post California Gold Rush Chinese, success was usually achieved through the wholesale and retail trade of goods imported from China that was sold locally. But along with these Huiguans came the Tongs. You've heard of them, the Chinese gangs. Perhaps some of you listened to that three-part series I presented on this very China History podcast feed based on Scott Seligman's book, Tong Wars. The Huiguans and Tongs were different kind of entities that played different roles in Chinese immigrant society. But there was considerable overlap, and it wasn't uncommon for some elder in the L.A. Chinese community to be both a member of a Huiguan and one of the local Tongs. The main guy at the time who everyone deferred to was named Sing Li. He was the boss of the Seiyup Company. The Seiyup was the most prominent Huiguan, hands down. They got their name from the Seiyup, or Siyi, the four counties in Guangdong, Xinhui, Taishan, Kaiping, and Unping. Not all, but pretty much all of these early pre-20th century arrivals from China came from any one of these four counties. So the Seiyup Company ran things in L.A.'s budding Chinatown, and Sing Li had two right-hand men, Yo Hing and Sam Yun. By 1870, businesses controlled by the Say Yup Company got a little bit too successful, and this led to a breakup of the organization. And it wasn't an amicable breakup when it happened. Yo Hing went on to form the Hong Chao Company, and Sam Yun set up the Nin Yong Company. And Sing Li continued to run the now much diminished Say Yup Company. There were two others, the Hop Wa and Qin Hua, who were minor players. Yo Hing was quite a guy in many ways. Unlike his old boss, Sing Li, and his new rival, Sam Yun, who mostly did business among their own kind, Yo Hing mixed with the local whites and Mexicans and carried out business with them. He was a loud and aggressive sort and didn't keep a low profile at all. Well, one of the most profitable businesses and a major source of income for the Huiguans and Tongs was prostitution. And the way things worked, girls would be imported from China into the U.S. on documents purporting that they were the wife of so-and-so or so-and-so's daughter. And then after she arrived in Chinatown, she was put to work as a prostitute serving the male clientele who frequented this godforsaken part of Los Angeles. Well, let's just say uh, there was a bottomless supply of women waiting back in the home country, and their lifespan working this kind of job wasn't long. They generated enough income such that when they ran away or sought refuge with Christian mission houses or other kind souls who took pity on them, no effort was spared to retrieve them. And when that happened, the girl was dealt with severely to show her co-workers what would happen to them if they had any notions of fleeing. And it was a common thing for the Huiguan, or Tong, to pay off local law enforcement to enlist their help in finding the escaped girls and bringing them back. And the Tongs paid top dollar, and crooked cops were always keen to be called in for this kind of work. And the cops working that beat always loved to get a nice piece of that action, doing the bidding of the Tongs. As 1871 rolled around, Yo Hing's Hong Chao Company had become the most powerful organization in Chinatown. The Sei Yup, who they replaced, was still a player, but in 1871, Sing Li, the longtime boss of the Sei Yup, had already left the scene and had sailed back to China. Sam Yun's Nin Yong Company had taken over the business of the Sei Yup, and this included all the bad blood that existed between the Sei Yup and Yo Hing's Hong Chao organization. Sam Yun's Nin Yong Company was rising fast, and by the summer of 1871, it had become a problem for the Hong Chao. Yo Hing and Sam Yun's rivalry for control at Chinatown, as once enjoyed by Sing Li, was well known, and these two men despised each other. What ignited the long fuse that led to the L.A. Chinatown massacre was a case involving a woman named Sing Yi. 
She was a prostitute purchased from one of the organizations based up in San Francisco for $340. She belonged to Sam Yun's Ninyong Company. What happened was she was abducted by one of Yo Hing's Hong Chao people, taken out to San Bernardino, tied to a tree, and tortured. And someone snitched on Yo Hing about the whole abduction and torture thing, and for something this sensational, the law stood up and took notice. So Yo Hing became a person of interest and ended up getting hassled and dressed down by law enforcement. Yo Hing was convinced it was one of Sam Yun's guys who had informed on him, and he planned to get even for this. And what followed were a series of attacks by Hong Chao members against suspected informants. And the interesting thing here is that men like Yo Hing, Sam Yun, and Sing Li, they had been in L.A. long enough to become very familiar with how to use and abuse the court system to obtain redress from each other and as well as how to trip each other up. So the Se Yup and Hong Chao and Nin Yong were always filing charges against each other, and with every claim and counterclaim, eh, the temperatures kept rising. 1871, by the looks of it, was shaping up to be one murderous year. The immediate spark that led to the massacre involved a woman named Yut Ho. She was married, that's married in quotation marks, to a certain Hing Sing of the Se Yup Company. The Se Yup were quite close with Sam Yun's Ninyong Company, and both of them opposed Yo Hing's Hong Chao. Yat Ho worked for Hing Sing, serving clients at his place of establishment, and somewhere along the line, as the story goes, she had befriended and fallen for a Hong Chao member named Li Yong, who worked as a cook in some L.A. household. Yo Hing, never one to pass up an opportunity, learned of this secret romance and, seeing how it jived with his interests, decided to help the couple. And one day, in early March, while Hing Sing was out of town on business, Yo Hing assisted Yat Ho and Li Yong in their desire to get married. Yo Hing arranged for them to be married in a local church where they obtained a legal marriage certificate. Whatever claims Hing Sing had to his Chinese marriage to Yat Ho were outtrumped by this document Li Yong now held in his possession. So they got hitched, and Yo Hing aided them in finding a place to lay low. When Hing Sing arrived back in town and saw what was going on, this whole thing exploded. Sam Yun jumped right in to assist his ally, Hing Sing, and he used his resources in the police to track down Yat Ho and drag her to a secret location where she was held and kept under guard. Sam Yun, on behalf of Hing Sing, intended to take Yo Hing to court to see who was legally entitled to Yat Ho. And they were certain they had the better case and that they could prove she was abducted by Yo Hing against her will. The press was having a field day with this story, especially the Romeo and Juliet angle of Li Yong and Yat Ho's forbidden love. Yo Hing was no doubt feeling quite pleased with himself, and he knew, even before he stared down his enemy in court, how this would play out. And when that day in early March 1871 came, and everyone was inside the courtroom, Li Yong was able to produce the legal marriage certificate attesting to his marital bond with Yat Ho. And he got to wave that in front of the judge, and Hing Sing had nothing to show to back up his claim. Well, nothing admissible to this court, anyway. So the judge decided in favor of Li Yong, which was a spiritual victory for Yo Hing. Well, all hell broke loose right there in the courtroom, and Sam Yun's humiliation at the hands of Yo Hing ratcheted up the heat substantially. This was Yo Hing's payback to Sam Yun for ratting him out to the police about that incident in San Bernardino. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Perhaps it was just a case of true love between Yat Ho and this Hong Chao member named Li Yong. As far as Yat Ho, that's all we ever hear from her. Where she went after this isn't clear. Somewhere else, back to China. It wasn't a Hing Sing, that's the only thing we could conclude. So this incident, for a whole bunch of reasons, really shook things up in Chinatown. And the residents there kept their heads down and minded their own business. They knew trouble was brewing. 
All throughout the summer and into the fall of 1871, things were tense, but the violence was minimal. By October, though, war appeared inevitable. It had finally gotten this bad. On Monday, October 23rd, there appeared on Calle de los Negros several men, obviously from out of town, and they had sailed down from San Francisco and were pegged as bujaldois, probably up to no good. These were the hatchet men of the tongs, the guys who carried out all the hits. These killers were in town to support Sam Yun in this war he was about to start. One of these men was named Ah Choi. He was allegedly Yat Ho's brother and was ordered down to L.A. by Sam Yoon to get involved in this whole matter regarding his sister. At 9.30 in the morning, Ah Choi and another one of his fellow out-of-towners tried to take out Yo Hing on the street, but they failed in their attempt. Then the next day, Tuesday, October 24th, both sides ran to the court and filed charges against the other for attempted murder. Around 5 p.m., the first one to die was Ah Choi. He was shot and killed by a Hong Chao member. The shooting of Ah Choi led to a concatenation of events that ignited the L.A. Chinatown massacre. Policeman Jesus Bilderain was within herring distance of the gunshot, so he was the first one on the scene. He saw a commotion and a crowd of people in front of Sam Yun's Wing Chong grocery store, and Ah Choi was bleeding out on the street. Bilderain started to look around, and in the process, while poking around the Wing Chong store, owned by Sam Yun, received a gunshot wound to the shoulder. He stumbled out into Calle de los Negros, took out his police whistle, and gave the signal. Everyone who heard that sound came running. Two of Sam Yun's guys were inside the grocery store firing away into the street, and open warfare was erupting on the streets between the two opposing sides. All the innocents ran for cover. Shop owners slammed their iron doors shut. A former saloon keeper and popular man about town, Mr. Robert Thompson, seeing what was going on, told some policemen that there was a lot of shooting going on and some Chinese were firing out into the street from inside that grocery store. Thompson pulled out his gun and walked towards the Wing Chong and started firing inside. Fire was returned, and Thompson got hit and died from the gunshot wound. Everyone from all the streets and alleys surrounding the Coronel block on the notorious Calle de los Negros came running. And as more people gathered, it attracted others, curious to see what was going on. At this point, Thompson was dead and Bilderain had been shot, and that was enough to get the adrenaline going, and the crowd of bystanders had grown to the size of a full-fledged mob of 500 people. When the sheriff arrived on the scene, he had men surround the Coronel block and ordered them to prohibit anyone from leaving. It's likely by this time, all the bad guys and gangsters had skedaddled and left the scene, the only people facing the mob were the local innocents caught up in a wrong place at the wrong time situation. Thirty-four of them were women, most of them not even twenty years old. Not all of them were engaged in prostitution either. Between sixty to seventy Chinese lived on Calle de los Negros. But it was already 8.30 p.m. Where else would they be except in their rooms? Because the sheriff had blocked off all the exits, no one could escape and flee to safety. We in our day know full well how easy it is to rile each other up online with the most provocative lies and trash talking. There's safety and anonymity just as there was safety in numbers at that moment on October 24th, 1871. This kind of thing, a mob, it inspires confidence. And with the dregs of downtown L.A. gathered in the street, along with some of the more respectable men about town, making the most vile accusations against the Chinese and passing rumors around the mob, well, that's music to the ears of any racist looking to let off a little steam. So the Chinatown residents huddled inside the Coronel block, listened in sheer horror as the screaming mob tried to force their way into the building. They had climbed on the roof as well and had started attempting to smash their way in from the ceilings. 
They had used fire to try and smoke them out and fire hoses to flush the terrified residents out of their hiding places. At 8.45 p.m. on the night of October 24, 1871, the more belligerent elements of the mob smashed down one of the doors and men stormed inside. And pretty much for the next hour or so, these earliest Chinese immigrants to Los Angeles, who inhabited this spit of land that today abuts the 101 freeway and Alvera Street, they were powerless in the face of this kind of onslaught. Well, I'll spare you the accounts of the violence meted out that evening, mostly against Chinese men and even young boys. Mob violence takes on a life all its own. Guns, knives, fists, and other weapons were turned on the innocent. Nooses were tied, bodies were mutilated, and strung up on the street for all to jeer at. The basest and most criminal elements were enjoying themselves immensely. They weren't out to kill these poor souls as much as they were trying to snatch their hidden wealth, their gold, jewelry, and cash. That was also part of the insult perpetrated on the residents of this Cornell block on this unpaved 500-foot-long stretch of road. Their rooms, their person, was just plundered by the mob. The following morning, there were 17 Chinese men and boys laid out by the local jail. Some were unrecognizable. One had already been murdered and buried the night of the massacre, so there were a total of 18 Chinese residents dead, about 10% of the Chinese population in L.A., if you count Ah Choi, the number of dead was 19. A reporter at the Los Angeles News had written of the lynching, quote, The lawless elements of society have been educated to believe that murder can be indulged in with impunity, provided it was committed by a mob instead of a single individual. Moreover, a notoriously racist California statute in 1863 prohibited any Chinese from giving evidence in court, either in favor or against any white person. End quote. Well, if you guess that justice didn't prevail in the end, you're right. After everything had been sorted out, a grand jury indicted 37 people who were part of the mob. 25 of those were charged with the murders of the Chinese. Only 10 rioters ever faced trial. Eight got off on manslaughter and received two to six years and got sent off to San Quentin. But that sentence was overturned the following year in 1872. The usual outcome for that time in history. Once everything quieted down, those who survived the ordeal returned to Calle de los Negros and life continued on. Yo Hing was the one everyone blamed for the disturbance. He'd end up dead on the streets of Chinatown in 1877 after a couple hatchet blows to the back of his head. Well, we all know what followed. 1882, Chinese Exclusion Act, 1885, Rock Springs Massacre, 1887, Hell's Canyon Massacre. Newspapers railed against the Chinese coast to coast. Some of them really went overboard with the hyperbole, not to mention racist pejoratives. The Los Angeles Star, La Estrella de Los Angeles, L.A.'s first paper, it ran 1851 to 1879. They printed more than their fair share of racist articles, painting the Chinese in the worst possible light. There was plenty of blame to pass around. This wasn't the first time, nor was it the last time, when Tong Wars erupted in the Chinese community that caused the deaths of bystanders and other local immigrants, trying their best to mind their own business and stay out of harm's way. The Los Angeles Star predicted correctly that this whole nasty affair would be forgotten quickly and all would return to normalcy. Indeed, this event, despite being the largest mass lynching in U.S. history, was relegated to the back pages of history. There's a memorial marking the spot where the L.A. Chinatown massacre took place. I snapped a photo of it for this uh, episode's cover image. Listen, uh, on October 17th, this Sunday, the UCLA Asian American Studies Center, Chancellor's Arts Initiative, and Asia Pacific Center, in partnership with LA's own Chinese American Museum, will be commemorating the 150th anniversary of the 1871 Los Angeles Chinatown Massacre with a live performance featuring music, movement, and VIP guest speakers. 
The whole thing is being live streamed, and I'll have a link at my website at teacup.media. Just check the show notes and go register. My good friend Hao Huang will be performing and speaking. So if you haven't listened to all nine episodes of the Blood on Gold Mountain podcast, I urge you to go check that out. The whole story of the L.A. Chinatown Massacre is brought to you through drama and beautiful music performed by the Flower Pistols, Micah Huang and Emma Guys. I'll also have a link in the show notes to that podcast, Blood on Gold Mountain. Well, the L.A. Chinatown Massacre may have been forgotten, but I wanted to cover this bit of Chinese-American history, and on this 150-year marker, I'll let you know that this happened. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Los Angeles. I thank you all for listening. Don't forget to check out my other two hit shows, the Tea History Podcast and the Chinese Sayings Podcast, and more to come. Take care, everyone, and do consider coming back next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.